thing. Don't wanna talk business, business. I guess I gotta be the one to see the summer. Who really in this in it? We so fed up. My life, ten up. Your time, been up. Deep prayers, sent up. Coulda do without him, out of him. Glad that I found him, found him. Crowd really wildin', wildin'. I'm kicking it, shallin', shallin'. FK Church. My name's Kale. I'm our next-gen pastor here, and I'm honored to get to bring the word this morning. Thank you all so much for being here on this Sunday after Thanksgiving. Anybody still full from Thursday? Just me? All right. Well, hey, stand to your feet. We're going to read God's word. We're just going to honor the reading of scripture this morning. And so we're going to be in a couple of days as we close out our series. We've been in Chasing Carrots. Been an amazing few weeks so far, hasn't it? It's been so awesome. I've been challenged. My toes have been stepped on, but the Lord has done some amazing things, and um, I'm excited to finish it off today. So uh, let's go to 1 John. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. You may just want to receive it this morning, maybe just physically putting your hands out just to receive all that God has for you today. I believe he wants to set some people free this morning, don't you? I believe that's what God does when he shows up. The, the, those that are in chains, that are, those that are in bondage are set free in the name of Jesus. And that's what he wants to do in this place today. So let's just receive the freedom that he's offering us. First John 2, 15 says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life comes not from the father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Amen. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 1, the other passage we're going to be in today. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 7. Paul says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, all your troubles, not just some, but all your troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we re ourselves receive from God. Come on, that's not just comfort to you, that's comfort through you. Amen. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm because we know that just as you share in our suffering, so also you share in our comfort. Father God, we just ask that you would come and speak to us today. Holy Spirit, come and step on our toes. We give you permission. We welcome that. Father, we ask you to just change our mind about what we're currently not seeing. Help us to see from your perspective. And just word of God, come and breathe life into our bones. We lean on you. We depend on you this morning. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Give somebody a high five and grab a seat. All right. Well, hey, like I said, my name is Kale. I'm, an, uh, I'm just so honored to be able to bring the word this morning. It has been an amazing uh, last month and really the whole year at LifeGate as we've been in a year of freedom has just been so... Uh, well, freeing. It's just been uh, so much freedom released uh, to my life, I know, and I'm sure I speak for so many of you in this room when I say that. And, uh, you know, for the last few weeks, Pastor Michael and Amy have been unpacking these things that we have a propensity to pursue more than we do the goodness of God. These different things in life that I believe the enemy would love nothing more than to trip us up with so that we're not effective in the kingdom of God. I think that that is the number one strategy of the enemy is to deceive you and to cause you to be ineffective in the kingdom of God. Amen. That, that's what he wants to do. But man, as long as we are chasing these carrots, then man, that's exactly what will happen. But as long as we're seeking the face of God, seeking first the kingdom and his righteousness, then man, everything falls into place and we live the life and fulfill the purpose that we were called here to fulfill. Amen. And so today, I just believe that God wants to set us free from the carrot of comfort. Say comfort. So we've talked about uh, approval. We've talked about perfection. We've talked about fame and these different things that set themselves up against the agenda of God in our lives. And again, if the enemy can get us chasing these things and we're, our, our effectiveness in the kingdom will we'll almost not exist. But man, if we can shift our priorities and not seek these things, not to seek comfort, but to seek the goodness of God, then man, there's nothing you can't do. Say nothing. There is nothing that you cannot do. So we're going to talk about the endless pursuit of 
comfort. And this is a Again, like we've been saying all month long, this isn't for you. If it's not for you, then it can be for the person next to you or it can be for the person at work or whoever it is. If you want to just deflect, feel free to do that. But, but no, I, just, I believe that this is something that we all struggle with. And I think the Holy Spirit is so strategic because, man, this is probably out of the four, this is the one I struggle with the most. It's just like clinging to comfort. I just want to be comfortable. If I can be comfortable, then I'll be, I'll be good. I'll live a good, easy, carefree life. And we think that that's what life is all about. But in reality, it's, it's not. The enemy wants you to think that, but that's not why we're here. We're not here to be comfortable. We're here to make a difference. We're here to be fruitful. That's why, you exist. That's why we exist. So here's, here's where we're going today. You may want to write this down. Just don't forget this. Worldly comfort has never led to spiritual fruit. Worldly comfort. Notice how I throw in the world worldly because, see, there's two kinds of comfort. Okay, and, and most of the time when you hear me say comfort today, I'm going to be referring to worldly comfort. But there is a comfort that only God can give. It's heavenly comfort. It's the comfort that we were designed to live out of the overflow of. This heavenly comfort that only God himself can give us. And when we live out of the overflow of that, then we're not going to be so concerned with feeling comfortable in this life. But the problem is we are so white knuckled around worldly comfort and just making sure that we're doing what feels good, feels right, feels normal. And our feelings, you know, they lie all the time. And so we think that if we feel comfortable, then we're doing, we're doing it right. But in reality, God has called you to a holy discomfort that we're going to talk about in just a little bit, that you can actually live out of this place of divine discomfort, that the Holy Spirit empowers you to live in this place of divine discomfort. That's what God wants for you. Worldly comfort will never lead to spiritual fruit. And so, man, today, my goal for the next 30 minutes or however long is that we just break up with divorce comfort. Just leave it behind. Amen? And so, listen, I, I believe that the Lord has taken me there, and I believe he wants to take us there today. And so what I want to ask is let's just lean in. Okay, none of these topics we've covered this month are easy to discuss. If they were easy to discuss, we probably wouldn't need to do a series about it, right? These are all things that are difficult, that we struggle with, that we wrestle with, and, and I just believe that he's setting us free today. I believe he's setting us free from clinging so desperately to comfort like our life depends on it. Listen, what if other people's lives depend on you not clinging to comfort? What if, what if everyone else depends, that their, their, their future, their potential salvation depend on the followers of Jesus forsaking worldly comfort so that we can be fruitful in our lives? What, what if everyone else is waiting on you to lean in instead of lean out in order for a difference and an impact to be made? What, what if that is all we need to do, the step we need to take? And I'm not saying it's an easy step, but it's the, it's the first step we got to just begin to embrace divine discomfort and let God use us however he sees fit. Because what I know is that Jesus said in John chapter 15, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible, he said that I'm the vine, you are the branches. So who, who's the vine? Jesus. You and I, we're the branches. What do the branches do? They're, they're the ones that carry the fruit, right? You, you don't ever see a piece of fruit hanging from the, the, the trunk, right? It's always hanging off the branches. And so if we're the branches, you and I are called to bear fruit. And not only that, he says fruit that will last. I don't want to just bear fruit that's going to last till next month. I don't, I don't want to just bear fruit that's going to last until 2024. I don't want to just bear fruit that's only going to last 10 years. I want to bear fruit that will last beyond my lifetime. That when, when my time is done here in 150 years, that my legacy will live on and will carry on and will continue to impact generation upon generation to come. That's what I want to be said of me. That's what I want to be said of you. You are called to bear fruit that lasts, but you're never going to get there if you're constantly in search of comfort. I wish I could tell you that, man, it's just, if you want to make an impact on the world around you, it's just this easy journey. Just do whatever feels right. That's just not God's way. That's not God's way. We got to be willing to lean into divine discomfort if we want to bear fruit that will last. But see, the thing about comfort is it's one of our most prized possessions in life. Can we just be honest in church today that, you know, if you think about the places of comfort, your home, 
How many of you live to get home at the end of the day? Like, just be honest. It's, I go about my day. I got my routine. I got my job. I got to go pick up the kids. And then we got this plan and this extracurricular activity, this rehearsal, this practice, whatever. And then finally, I just get home. And that's what I've been waiting for. The comfort of your home, the comfort of that couch, the comfort of your futon, the comfort of your bed. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, if you're so fortunate, the comfort of your hot tub. I don't know if you got one, invite me over. You know, just like the comfort of all these things, the comfort of my car that I drive. You know, it's like if, if you've ever taken an Uber, like, man, I don't like being in another people's car. This is weird. I want to be in, in mine. It's more, way more comfortable. And so we, we love the comfort of our home, the comfort of vacation. I don't know if you just came back from a, a Thanksgiving vacation, but, you know, we, we love just kind of getting away. How many of you all year long, you're just counting down to the day you go on vacation? Some of you, you have something on your phone as we speak that is counting down until you take that cruise or go to, go to Panama City or wherever it is. You, you got the countdown and you're just ready. Why? Because vacation brings a sense of, I'm comfortable. I don't, if I don't want to talk to people, I don't have to talk to people. I don't have to look at my phone. I don't have to get on social media. I don't have to be around this person that drives me nuts. I don't have to. I can just relax and just be comfortable and just take it easy. Isn't that so nice? And so we love it. We, we count down the moments till we can get there. And then you know, our relationships, I hope that you feel comfortable around your family. If not, you need to find some new family, you know, but I hope you feel comfortable around your family and maybe some close friendships, you know, where it's just like, man, I just, I feel so uncomfortable around all these strangers all day. Anybody like you have like little to no relationship with your coworkers and that's okay if so, um, you know, maybe it's just like, I'm just kind of there and I'm just getting through the day. I got my nine to five and then I get to go home and then I can be around the people that I'm comfortable with. But for the most part, I'm just uncomfortable around people, especially the people you don't know. Any introverts in the room, just be honest. Like, being around people, I just, you know, if it's people I know, I'm good. But if it's people I don't know, I'm, I just shrivel up. And I don't know what to say. And are they going to talk first or am I going to talk first? And I just don't know. <laughs> how does this work? You know, how do I talk to people? And so we, we're looking for comfort. And the root of that is a fear of discomfort. That we fear discomfort more than anything else in this life. If you think about some of the greatest fears, uh, I haven't done a study on this or anything. This is just my guess. But, you know, like public speaking is one of the greatest fears humans have ever had. I actually heard this a couple months ago, that some people would rather die than speak in front of a group of, a large group of people. That means that at the funeral, you'd rather be doing the, you'd rather be in the coffin than doing the eulogy. I just, I, when I heard that, I was like, man, that's so, it's so true. But what's the root of it? Discomfort. Discomfort. It's, it's uncomfortable for me to talk in front of me, people. It's uncomfortable for me to be around this person. It's uncomfortable for me to go on this mission trip. I think that's great for all the pastors and, and Nicholas and people. Like, they can do that, but that's just not, you know, that's not my thing. You know, and so... We're afraid of discomfort, but see, what, what I see when I read my Bible, you can tell me if you see the same thing, is that Jesus himself, he had 12, well, he had a lot of followers, but he had 12 disciples with him basically everywhere he went. And, and he, what I love is that he equipped them to do ministry. He just didn't do it all himself. Jesus just could have done everything himself and said, hey guys, watch this, person healed and I mean, he did that sometimes, but for the most part, he equipped them to go out. He said, hey, you go and heal people. You go lay hands on people. You go feed these people, right? And so everything that Jesus asked his disciples to do, none of it was comfortable. None of it. And listen, did, did Jesus and his disciples not make the greatest impact on the world that we've ever seen? They never, ever once did anything that made them feel comfortable, it was never comfortable. They had to lean in instead of lean out. And I just believe that's what God is calling us to do today is just lean in to the feelings of, of discomfort that we feel because, listen, it may feel uncomfortable now, but God's pleased. If God is pleased but everyone else is uncomfortable, that's okay because we're, who, who are we here to, to, to glorify? God, not people. We're here to live with one another, to do life together. And listen, I love you know, vertical, or what is it, uh, horizontal relationships. But man, I exist for him, me and him. And if he's pleased, that's all that matters. Even if nobody else gets it, listen, not everybody's gonna get you as a follower of Jesus. Not everybody's, not everybody's gonna get you when you preach the gospel in boldness. Not everybody's gonna get you when you decide to go to church instead of going to this party. Not everybody's gonna get it. 
But it's not about everyone else feeling comfortable. It's about God being glorified and honored. That's what matters more than anything else. So Jesus never asked his disciples to do anything that made him comfortable. He's sure not going to ask you and I to do anything that makes us comfortable. There's a quote by Neil Walsh. I, I never knew. I don't even know who that is, and I didn't know he said it, but this is a great quote. You've probably heard it before. Life begins at the end of your comfort zone. In other words, until you've left your comfort zone, you're not really living. It's, it's harsh, but it's true. Is that if, if we're not ever willing to be uncomfortable, to approach the person, to have the conversation, to go to the place overseas, or maybe even just go down our street, if we're not willing to do any of those things, then are we really living the fullest life that God has called us to? We're not. There's so much we're missing until we're, until we're willing to step out of our comfort zone and just do what God has called us to do. I want to share a personal story about that very subject with you. And this happened uh, just a few months back. It, it was not one of those stories, hey, this was, you know, 10 years ago. This happened just six months ago, seven months ago, back in April. Um, so me and uh, Nicholas, our outreach coordinator, and uh, it was three adults, and we took 15 students to Raleigh, North Carolina for a mission trip. If you were here at LifeGate at that time, you remember us talking about that and all the students that came. It was just an amazing, life-changing trip. It was such a rewarding experience. Um, me, Nicholas, and Hannah, we were just so honored to get to be a part of that and see these students just be so bold for the kingdom. And so we got to do uh, food pantries, take them out into the community, and just get to give people groceries otherwise wouldn't have it. Like there's nothing better than that. We got to host a dinner for homeless people, got to see them fall in love with Jesus, got to pray for them. It was amazing. But one of the most uncomfortable things we did was go to a local mall in the area and share Jesus with people. Anybody in here ever done street evangelism or just evangelism in public places where you, you know, you go up and you initiate conversation with a total stranger about Jesus? How many of you can testify the first time you do it, it is like the scariest thing ever. You, like you'd rather be pushed off a cliff than do that. You know what I mean? Like, and it sounds so crazy because it's like, well, that's what we're here to do, right? Spread the gospel. But man, it, it's one thing to talk about. That's a cool thing to do. And it's another thing to actually do it. There it was very two very different things, you know, as far as talking about it and actually putting it into practice. And so we're at this mall. It's a nice mall. Don't get me wrong. It's a, it's a very nice mall. A lot of people, a lot of shoppers. And what we did is we split up into groups. So like I said, there were about 18 of us total. We split up in the groups and we said, hey, we're going to go. Uh, you know, we're going to pray together before we go in. And then our whole objective in the hour and a half, two hours of being here is to find people. It sounds creepy when you say it that way, but just bear with me. To find people that might need prayer, might need a word of encouragement, might even need salvation. And so that was our prayer. We said, Lord, just point out, you know, highlight somebody is the, the language we use. Highlight somebody that may need some encouragement today. So, I mean, y'all, we're straight up, like, in, out in these streets, like, preaching Jesus. And, and listen, y'all, I'm the youth pastor, and my heart is racing. Like, I'm, I'm so nervous. I'm like, man, I got to look good for these students. Like, I got to make sure that I, you know, hey, I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm not going to let students show me up. I'm going to be the one that, that does this. There ain't no student that's going to win more souls than me today. You know what I mean? And so I, I just make it into a competition. It's not, but, you know, that's the way I think of it. So um, we go in. And I remember I got three students, none of whom had ever done this before, with me. And I start thinking to myself, okay, somebody's got to make the first move, and it's got to be me. It's got to be me. I, so I'm putting all the pressure on myself, my heart's racing. I'm like, Lord, I know I need to do this, but I'm so nervous. And so finally, I go up to this guy. He's sitting on the railing of, um, you know, we're on the second floor of the mall. He's on the railing on his phone. And so, you know, naturally, the, the posture of don't bother me. You know what I mean? Like, you ever seen somebody doing that? Just like, they don't want anybody coming up to him and talking to him. They're like, please leave me alone. I'm, this, is, this is the face of go away. And so, but, you know, I'm like, all right, we got to do this. And so I go up, and the students aren't going to do it first. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to go. And so I walked up to this guy, and I'm like, hey, man, we're a group uh, from a church, and, and we just, we're going around praying for people. I don't know how I said it exactly. I kind of blacked out. But uh, I'm like, hey, we're, we're, we're praying for people, you know, and such. So, hey, can you, could you use any prayer and, uh, and, and he just kind of looks up from his phone. He's like, no, nah, I'm good. He goes right back to his phone. And I'm like, no, I failed. You know, he's just like, I dropped the ball. And so uh, that, was, that was hard because, you know, rejection is one of the greatest fears in doing that. It's like, what if people say no? What if they don't want it? And so anyway, I'm like, all right, well, let's keep going. 
Went up to the next one, and same thing, same answer. No, I'm, I'm okay, I'm busy. You know, because a lot of they're shopping, they got things to do, places to be. And so finally, I think it was like four people, and everybody was so nice about it. Like everybody who, who didn't want it, they were nice, except for, uh, I, I think I heard a few for students. Uh, people kind of showed their ugly face to some of the students, and I'm like, well, it didn't happen to me, so I'm good. You know, that's fine. <laughs> You know, they were a little harsh with some of our, our teenagers. So, uh, but that, that was the, you know, kind of the, the thing about it is it was this level of we have to walk up to somebody and talk to them about Jesus. And there's so much nervousness that comes with that. But I remember after about four or five people, this one guy, I went up to him and I said the same thing. And he just started pouring his heart out to me. He just started sharing, like, this is what's going on in my life. And, and I, I'm a total stranger, y'all, who I was. But he just started sharing his, his heart and his life. And I got to pray with that man. He already knew Jesus. But, man, I got to pray with him and encourage him. And it was one of the most rewarding things I've ever done. It was so special just to get to minister to this guy, to get to, to love on him. And, just, and, and that took so much boldness, y'all. And I'm not saying this to, like, toot my own horn and say I'm awesome. I'm just saying that if we would just lean into boldness and step out of discomfort, there's so many things that God wants to do through us, but it requires our yes and our obedience. It requires us saying, God, you can do what you want to do through me. I'm not going to limit you, God. I'm not going to say, well, God, you can do this, but not that. I'm not going to say, well, God, I'm, I'm just too nervous. I don't have the right things to say, so you can, I, don't do it through me. Do it through somebody else. And we deflect and we push it off. But all the while, God is saying, just, just be available. And there's no limit to what I'll do through you. There's no limit to what I will choose to, to do and the fruit that you will bear because you're submitted and you're obedient to me. And it was just one of the coolest things ever I had to share it. And so I want to go back up to uh, 1 John chapter 2 and just kind of talk about what John is referring to when he says, do not love the world. What does this mean? Because I think we hear that and we're like, aren't we supposed to love the world and love all the people? Well, see, there's a different meaning than what I think you and I realize. He's not saying don't love the people in the world. He's saying don't love the spirit and the systems of this world. That Actually, if you break down the, uh, the original language here, what the writer meant, what uh, Paul or sorry, John meant was don't love the systems of this world. Love the people in it, but don't love the spirit of this world. And really what that is is a life that doesn't need God. A life that doesn't need him. That I, I don't need God. I don't need faith. I don't need to depend on anybody. I got this. He's saying don't, don't love that spirit of the things of this world. Because it's impossible, what we don't realize is that it's impossible to love both God and the systems of this world. We can't love them both at the same time. We got to understand that if we want to begin to make a difference is that we can't love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength and still love the systems of this world equally. Those two things can't coexist at the same time. And so we have to forsake one and embrace the other. And, you know, he talks about the, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. And really, where do those things come from? They come from the world. It says right there, they don't come from the Father. And actually, 2 Corinthians says that Satan is the God of this world. And, and, and I think a lot of us, we hear and we're like, whoa, I thought God was the God of everything. And he is. But listen, he, he reigns in heaven and he reigns through his church. But the spirit and operation and most of the things of this world, you can look around and tell, it's not God, it's the enemy. And so the enemy is, is after us trying to make us comfortable so that we won't be significant and make a difference. And see, if you think about it, it's talking about the pride of life. Pride is the root of comfort. In other words, if you can be obsessed with yourself, then you're going to begin to be obsessed with comfort because you don't want to do anything that's going to make you look bad or silly or inept in any way. And so if, if, if the enemy can get you obsessing about yourself, he's going to get you comfortable. And if he can get you comfortable, he's going to make you ineffective. And I just believe God has so much more for us. The promise at the end of that passage is that the world, the things of this world will pass away. But doing the will of God will lead to eternal life. So the things of this world, the pride of life, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, all those things will pass away, but whoever does the will of God will live forever. Forever is a long time. Eternal life, not just life here, but life there. That's what awaits us if we would embrace divine discomfort and begin to be okay with saying, God, I'm not comfortable, but I yield completely to you. Have your way. 
do what it is that you want to do because, God, it's not about what I want. It's about what you want. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Y'all, that's not just a fancy prayer. That should be our reality day in and day out. God, let your kingdom come. Not my will, not my plans, but yours be done. Let yours come to pass. Amen means let it be so. And so, man, what if we just allowed God to have his way instead of us having our way? we got to let go of pride. A couple of comfort traps I want to mention briefly. is One, one is image, self-image and pride. I already said a couple things about it, so I won't spend too much time on it, but we, we are so afraid of looking like we don't know what we're doing. Like if we're just all honest in the room, I'm not going to make you raise your hand, but let's just be honest. If we're all completely authentic, we are afraid of looking silly or like we don't know what we're doing. Like we can't stand that. I can't stand that feeling. You know, like before I come up here and on a Sunday or I go down there on a Sunday night with your students, you know, like, man, I want to make sure I know what I'm talking about. God, I want to look good. And sometimes I'm tempted to make it more about me than it is about him. I told y'all, I'm, I struggle with this. I believe it's the Lord's will that I talked about it because, man, there's some things I need to get free in. But we just, we want to look so comfortable. We want to we wanna look so like we got it figured out. Like everything's good on the outside, even if nothing's good on the inside. If I can just stay comfortable, then I'll be good. But really, you know, the, the root of that is the fear of man, the fear of opinions, the fear of everybody else's thoughts. But we don't exist for man, we exist for God. We don't exist for man, we exist for God. You don't exist for everybody else, you exist for him. He'll use you to make a difference on everybody else, but really you're not here for them, you're here for him. That's why you're here. And the sooner you understand that, the sooner you can forsake pride so that you can be effective in the kingdom of God. And see, I think it's so, I just, I just think it's so ironic that usually the things we do that man loves, they displease God. And the things we do that God loves displease man. And the two sides are never going to agree. And we have to reconcile ourselves to that reality and decide that what God thinks is more important than what they think. Like we have to just come to terms with that reality that, hey, if I'm doing, if what I do everybody on earth loves, then I don't know, is God really pleased with me? And if I'm doing everything that, you know, God loves and hey, I have to be okay with the world's not going to get it. They're not going to agree. They're not going to like it. They're going to they're going to hate me. They're going to slander me. They're going to do all this. And so we have to be okay with that and come to peace with that if we want to begin to be effective. So a comfort trap is pride and self-image. And another one is a lack of faith. See, when we're, when we're comfortable, we don't need faith. When we live comfortable lives, then there, there's no need for faith. We have to trust God in order to step out of our comfort zones. Completely. We have to trust that God will use us. We have to trust and have faith. See, faith, if you break it down, is just believing in what we don't see. Believing in what we, what we cannot see. And so Hebrews 11, the faith chapter, uh, the writer says, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. You can't please God unless you have faith. Unless you have faith. Why? Because we can't see God, but we can believe in God with our hearts and live for him in faith and in deed. And so faith is necessary to do anything that please God. Anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Man, that's such a powerful statement. Without faith, you can't please God. But with faith, there's nothing you can't do for God. So we got to embrace faith. And in, in order to do that, it's, it's going to cause us to be uncomfortable. When we lean into faith, then we're able to take those steps and take those risks. Yes, it can be a risk sometimes. But if you have faith in God, he's going to bless the risk you're taking, and you're going to see fruit come from your obedience. It may feel like a risk. It may feel like I just, this doesn't feel right, and I just don't like it, and my feelings, my feelings. And we just get so married to our feelings. But if we would just leave those aside and pursue the, the reality of righteousness and the, 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 the harvest that is at hand, then, man, we would be so much more willing to leave behind comfort if it means that we get to see righteousness, if we get to see fruit, if we get to see an impact being made on the world around us, then we are so willing to just forsake what feels comfortable in order to please and honor God. See, listen, I, I've been building a case. You're going to think I'm crazy for saying this, but God doesn't want you to live an uncomfortable life. Because who would sign up for that? Who, who wants to live a life of no comfort? He's not saying don't be comfortable. He's saying replace the world's comfort with my comfort. There's, a, there's an exchange that must take place. 
if we're going to be effective in the kingdom of God. And it's to forsake, divorce the world's comfort so that we may receive his comfort. And so the world's comfort is counterfeit. It's not, in other words, it has no value. It has the appearance of value, and it may closely resemble value, but in reality, it's worthless. Counterfeit comfort. That's what the world is trying to sell us. If it, you know, just feel comfortable. Stay in your comfort zone. You know, just be in this place where it feels normal to you, and just, you know, you, you can just coast on through, and that, just live in that place. That's what the world wants to sell us. But in reality, it's, it's worthless. It's not going to do anything. It's not going to make a difference. Counterfeit money is an example. Like, I don't know. I've seen this a lot at fast food restaurants. I don't know why it's only at fast food restaurants that I've seen this. Maybe it happens in other places. But, you know, you go to pay with cash, and they, they want to make sure it's real. And so they take your dollar, and they kind of hold it up in the light like that and just kind of, I don't know what they're looking for. It's kind of strange to me, but they're making sure it's, it's real money and not like Monopoly money. I don't know. But anyway, they're, they're making sure that it's genuine and it's real. And, and that's kind of what it's like. It's just to make sure that it has value and it's not worthless. And the, the comfort that God gives you has value. The comfort that the world gives you is worthless. It's nothing. It, get, it will give you nothing. And so how do we do this? How do we live this out? Divorcing worldly comfort and instead living in a place of heavenly comfort. I want to break it down just a few things. First thing we got to do is we embrace what is authentic. We embra- in other words, we embrace the real thing. Listen, I don't want the phony comfort. I want the real comfort. I don't want the fake facade appearance of what may seem like comfort and, and, and not have what Jesus died to give me. I don't know about you, y'all, but I want everything he died to give me. I, want, I don't want to miss one single thing. I don't want to spend 70, 80, 90 years on this earth and not receive all that he has for my life. I don't want just some of it, y'all. I want all of it. And he wants to give you his comfort. He wants to give you his peace. He wants to give you his presence. But it means that you must believe in him and what he defines these things as. Because listen, like I said, the world has a definition of comfort, but God has a different one. The world has a definition of perfection, but God says you're perfect because your heavenly father is perfect. The world has a definition of approval, but God says I already approve of you. You don't need anybody else's approval. So there's so many of these things we've discussed that the world will try to sell you a counterfeit version of, but God has given you the real thing. And I don't want to miss what he has for me. So embrace what is authentic. 2 Corinthians 1.4, we read it earlier, says that he comforts us in all of our troubles in order that we may comfort others. In other words, whatever he does for you, he wants to do through you. So if he has shown you comfort, he wants to use you to bring comfort. Remember, freedom to me, freedom through me. That's what he wants for you. He wants to comfort you so that your comfort tank is full so that you may release the spirit of comfort to everyone you encounter, from the stranger to the family for, and everyone in between. He wants to release comfort through your life. And listen, verse 5 in that same passage says that you may have to suffer through worldly discomfort, that, that there will be some suffering involved, that there will be some, listen, Jesus never promised you an easy life. He, did, he said, I'll, I'll bear fruit through you, but it doesn't mean that everything's going to be easy. And matter of fact, he said, in this world, you will have trouble. Take it to the bank. You're going to struggle from time to time. It's not always going to be easy, but I want to do things through you that you couldn't even imagine. Listen, you may have to suffer through some worldly discomfort, but the trade-off is you get God's comfort, and that's a good deal. That's a, that is a worthwhile exchange to forsake the world's comfort to receive his. And the result of all this is patient endurance. Patient endurance. In other words, God will give you the strength to face trials because he's going to sustain you through his comfort. Listen, I, I don't know about you, but uh, Pastor Tony has always said that we're either pre-storm, current storm, or post-storm. In other words, that these things are inevitable, that we're going to experience trials and tribulations. But what we can know and what we can rest in is that the God of comfort will be with us and sustain us, even in the face of all that may come your way and try to trip you up and stop you from being the person God's called you to be. And so, man, that is a comforting reality, amen? Just that God has given us what the world can't give, the world can't give it to you, man. It's fake. It's phony. It's not real. But he'll give you real, lasting, authentic comfort that will sustain you through all your days, through highs, through lows, through mountains, through valleys. The comfort of God 
that he wants to give you. And so embrace what is authentic. Number two, this is my favorite one. Embrace divine discomfort. Embrace divine discomfort. If you want to make a difference, you've got to embrace divine discomfort. I'll say it again. Worldly comfort has never led to spiritual fruit. Comfort as the world defines it has never made anybody make an impact or a difference in the world. Think about people like Martin Luther King Jr. who lived a life that stood against injustice and prejudice and racism. It's terrible things that should not exist, but unfortunately, because we live in a broken world, they do. And he took a stand, and I guarantee it was never comfortable. It was never comfortable for him to be beaten, to be thrown into jail, to be ridiculed, to be mocked. Eventually, he gave his life for it. But it was never comfortable for him. Paul, the Apostle Paul, who wrote the passage that we just read a minute ago, Man, he, was, he spent the first part of his life killing Christians, going against the kingdom of God, and then he had this massive conversion moment, and all of a sudden he became the greatest missionary we've ever seen. Wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, spread the gospel to probably more people than anybody in history. And I guarantee it wasn't comfortable. A matter of fact, I know he wrote the book of Philippians from prison. It wasn't easy. It was uncomfortable. But thank God they had the comforter that was there with them in the midst of their discomfort. And Jesus himself... The son of God, he was fully God, but y'all, he was fully man. He was fully man too, so he, he had to face discomfort just the same as you and me. The Bible even says he faced all the temptations that you have, but he never sinned. Faced all the stuff that we go through, but he never sinned. He had to face discomfort, but the way that all these people I just mentioned got through it is they embraced divine discomfort. They knew that what they were standing for was greater than what was standing against them. They knew that the opinions of man weren't going to change anything, but the opinions of God, the the reality of God, the truth of God could change everything. And so they leaned more into that than anything else. And I just want to ask you a really practical question. Here are some things that God has called you to do. Just a few. Preach the gospel to all creation. Make disciples. Love everyone, everywhere, every day. Take care of the sick, widows, and orphans. Set the captives free. And I could go on. But I want to ask you this question. Would any of those feel comfortable to do? And it doesn't matter if you're, you know, if you've been following Jesus for a long time and you're a seasoned uh, evangelist in the streets and you've done it so many times and you're like, I could be up here preaching this message because I just preach the gospel everywhere I go and I'm just so, you know, and you think you got it figured out. It doesn't matter if you're there or if you're on the other side and you're like, no, I've never done any of this. All this makes me nervous, makes me uncomfortable, right? All of it requires boldness. And all of it is going to make you feel uncomfortable when you first do it. And so that proves right there that leaning in instead of leaning out is the way to go. To lean into divine discomfort instead of leaning out so that we can continue to operate in our comfort zone, but yet be ineffective in the kingdom of God. Listen, I want to lean in. I don't want to lean out. I want to lean into all that God has for me, even if it challenges me, if it stretches me, if it's hard for me, if it makes me fearful, if if it's any of these things. Listen, because you know why? Because the presence of God is going to be with me every step of the way. I'm not alone. I'm not alone in this. I'm not having to figure it out on my own. He said, just trust me and I got you. He just trust me. I'm going to take care of you. I'm I'm going to take care of your feelings of discomfort. I'm going to see to it that you have everything you need. Just just lean in. Embrace divine discomfort. Don't just put up with it. Embrace it. Paul said in Acts 28, the last two verses in Acts, said for two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Say all boldness and without hindrance. See, this is how Paul lived his life. And he wouldn't have needed boldness if it wasn't something that the enemy was going to try to talk him out of. He wouldn't have needed boldness had it not been something that was going to require him to just buck up and be okay with being uncomfortable. See, I think what many of us need to do is just get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And I know that sounds like, a, like it contradicts itself, but we have got to become comfortable with the idea of being uncomfortable because you'll never bear fruit unless you do that. I know this is hard, y'all. It's hard for me. But man, I believe that sometimes the greatest limitation to our effectiveness in the kingdom of God is our own comfort. Holding on to it so tight. 
I just got to be comfortable. I can't do what challenges me. Get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Embrace divine discomfort. And then the last is embrace that this world is not your home. The world around you, listen, it's, it's all going to fade away. Everything you see to your right, to your left, to in front of you, behind you, all the, all the material things of this world, we can't take them with us. But what we can take is our relationship with God. That's what's going to get us there. Our faithfulness, our intimacy that we have with him. This world is, is not our home. There's a song I love that says, I will carry a cross in a song where I don't belong where I don't belong, where I, listen, I don't belong in this, in this world. In other words, it's not my home. I know I'm here on purpose. There's intention that I'm here, but I don't belong here in a sense that I'm a, I'm a citizen of this world. I will carry my cross, but it's not my home. I don't belong here. I'm just passing through. But while I'm here, if I want to make an impact, if I want to make a difference, I can't cling to comfort anymore. I got to let it go. I got to let go of my comfort and so listen, we, gotta, we can't take our cues from the world anymore. That, that's just not going to cut it anymore. We just got to let it go. Got to let go of what the world says, what the world expects of us. We need a better solution. And Jesus said in Matthew 16, 25, he said, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever, wants, whoever loses their life for me will find it. So whoever wants to save it is actually going to lose it. But if you lose it, you'll actually find it. That is the upside down kingdom that we've been invited into. That if we would lose our life, lose our sense of comfort, be okay with doing what makes us uncomfortable. Listen, some of you in here are thinking, you've been thinking for five, ten years, should I go on a mission trip? Should I go? Should I go? Should I go? The answer is yes, go. Let this be a plug for mission trips right now. Just do what makes you uncomfortable. Well, I'm just not comfortable with the cost. Well, I'm just not comfortable with the language barrier. Well, I'm just not comfortable with the culture. Well, I'm just not comfortable with the long flight. Just trust God. If you feel led to do it, don't you think he's going to bless it if it's really what he wants for you? Don't you really think that God's going to anoint and bless every good work that you put your hand to so long as it's to serve him? That's what he'll do. And so, man, you're on the fence. Should I do this? Do it. And maybe not even to that extreme, but just should I talk to my coworker about Jesus? I just, I feel so nervous. I don't know if I should do it. Just do it. He'll give you the words to say. He'll show you. He'll, give, he'll even give you a, a clear picture and maybe even a roadmap of, hey, this is what, this is, you know, here's what you're going to say. Here's what it's going to look like, all these things. And maybe it'll be more of a thing where he's saying, hey, trust me. Just trust me. I know I'm not going to give you all the, 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 the end result of what it's going to be, but just do it and trust that I'm going to bless it, that there's going to be fruit, fruit that is produced through your obedience. And that's what I love is, see, when we see fruit, it means that there was obedience that, that came before the fruit. Fruit follows obedience. So when you obey God, he will produce fruit through you, through your obedience, through your yes. He will unleash fruit in your life. And so, man, these different things that we're kind of not sure, we're on the fence, we're trying to decide, should I do it, should I not? Just trust God, and he's going to take care of it. Whatever it is, bring it to your mind. Whatever it is that you're trying to decide, what should I do? Should I take this step of faith? Should I go out of my comfort zone here? The answer to that question is always going to be yes. Because remember, like we said earlier, life begins at the end of your comfort zone. If you really want to live, if you really want to make an impact on the world around you, then we must embrace divine discomfort. And see, when we adopt an eternal perspective, the temporary discomforts of this life pale in comparison to the glory that's coming. Romans chapter 8 says, uh, he said, I consider all the sufferings that I'm facing nothing compared to the glory that I know awaits me. And y'all, can I just tell you, the stakes are too high for every believer in Jesus Christ to live a comfortable life. The stakes are too high. Listen, the world has never been changed by comfortable Christians. No comfortable Christian has ever made an impact. Maybe they got to heaven, but did they make a difference? The world can only be changed through bold Christians who lean in and not lean out. Say, God, however you want to use me, you can use me. God, whatever you see fit, I say yes. God, whatever you want to say, say it through me. God, whatever you want to do, do it through me. God, whatever it is you want to unleash on the world around me, I give you my yes. I break up with comfort that I may be used in the kingdom of God and truly, truly, truly make a difference. That you're, you have a platform. You don't just live a life, you live a platform. 
And what is the message of that platform? Jesus Christ has saved me. He can save you too. But that requires you to be uncomfortable. We have to lean in, not lean out. So man, let's, let's today, let's break up with worldly comfort and replace it with the comfort that only God can give us. And I want you to consider the imprint of your life, right? Because we're all trying to leave a legacy. We all want to make a difference. Consider the imprint of your life if you live uncomfortably versus living comfortably. I think for some of us today, we just got to take that first step and acknowledge that if I'm going to do anything for the kingdom of God, I can't just cling to my comfort. I have to let that go. And then figure out what is that first step for you? Is it going on a mission trip? Is it giving financially to something? Is it praying for this person? Is it having this conversation with a coworker or a family member? Is it figure out what it is for you and ask the Holy Spirit to guide you and he's going to. Like when you ask the Holy Spirit to do the divine miraculous things to you, do you think he's ever like, well, I just don't know about that? Of course he wants to, but you have to want it too. And so, man, that's my prayer for everyone in here is that we just begin to desire the things that may feel uncomfortable, but it pleases and honors our our Heavenly Father. That's how we start living a life that that matters. And so, man, let's just do that today. Let's get free. Amen. Let's just lay some things down today. You know, in just a minute, we're going to go into a song. There's going to be prayer teams gathered around. But I want us to just lay down comfort today and to not pick it back up again. Maybe you need to come have a moment at the altar. Maybe you need prayer. Maybe you just need to turn your seat into an altar. But let's just lay those things down so that we can begin to bear fruit that will last in our lives. Amen? Bow your heads and close your eyes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much just for challenging us. (laughs) Holy Spirit, for stepping on our toes, for helping us to think bigger about what we're currently facing, what we're currently seeing in our lives. Father, we know that we all too often will cling to comfort, that we'll just be so concerned with being comfortable that we won't be effective. But Lord, today is the last day we'll ever do that. We just commit to you today. Father, we give you our yes, we give you everything, and we just ask you to use us in whatever way you see fit. And Father, we just let go of comfort. We grab hold of yours, to divine comfort that you've given us so that we can begin to make a difference, to leave our mark, to leave an imprint on the world around us. So God, give us the words to say whatever it is we need to say. Give us the things to do whatever it is we need to do. Give us the thoughts to think whatever it is we need to think. Just transform us from the inside out. Come on, you gotta really want it. Lord, transform me from the inside out. Make me more like you so that I can begin to bear fruit in my life. Father, I break up with comfort today and I pursue righteousness. I pursue fruitfulness in my life. Thank you for helping me walk it out. And if you're in here today and you need Jesus, maybe you've never accepted him as your Lord and Savior, and you know that you need him, that there's this longing in your heart that can only be fulfilled by him, by a relationship with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Listen, today is your day. Today is your day. He wants to meet you exactly where you're at. So maybe you need to come for, to him for the very first time. Or maybe you say, you know, I've made that decision before, but I know that I'm not where I need to be with God. I know that I'm far from him, that I, I don't have this intimacy that I need with him. And so I, I just need to come back. I need to renew that relationship, renew that decision today in this place. And so if you're either one of those decisions, you need to either come to him for the very first time or maybe come back to him. Listen, no one's looking around. This is your moment. This is your time. It's not today. It's not, to, or it's not tomorrow. It's not the next day. It's right now in this moment. So don't miss it. If you need Jesus in this place, make sure you get him today. He's here for you. He wants to start a relationship with you. So if that's you, on the count of three, let me just see your hand. You need Jesus today. One, two, three. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, glory to God. Anybody else, you want to make sure you get in with these others. You don't want to miss your moment. You need Jesus. Come back to him, maybe. I'm going to give you some words to pray. It may sound something like this, but pray your own prayer in your heart. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for saving me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying the death that I deserved and for giving me a fresh start with you. God, I just commit to you that I'm, I'm saved. I'm born again. I'm not going back to the old ways. I'm being sanctified by your Holy Spirit. And Lord, just help me to walk out this relationship with you every day. Help me to break up with comfort, to live a life of significance that matters, that means something. Father, help me to walk it out. Holy Spirit, come into my heart. Help guide my decisions that I may walk with you all the days of my life. I love you, Jesus. Thank you for loving me. Heaven is my home. In Jesus' name, amen.